So in the last video, we understood what Bitcoin is, what problem it aimed to solve and how it solved it. In this video, let's try to understand a few shortcomings of it and how other blockchains came into the picture to fix that. So there are two broad issues that other blockchains tend to fix. The first one is that Bitcoin is just a store of money. It doesn't really solve any other problem. For example, if someone wants to loan their money or their Bitcoin, uh, there's no easy way to do that or write that in a protocol on top of Bitcoin. And there are a bunch of other use cases. For example, what if someone wants to launch their own token on the Bitcoin network? There's no easy way to do that either. To solve some of these problems, a few other blockchains started to emerge, each solving one specific use case or a bunch of specific use case around 2012, 2013. But each one of them solved a certain problem and you couldn't really solve something else using it. The second problem is, of course, a lot of machines are doing so much work trying to compete against each other that causes a lot of unnecessary compute, which is considered harmful for the environment and so on. So to solve the first problem, uh, back in 2015, the Ethereum network was launched. Now Ethereum did use proof of work uh, and it still does until today, but there's one special property about Ethereum. Ethereum actually introduced something called as an EVM, which stands for Ethereum Virtual Machine. What the EVM lets people do is, it lets users execute arbitrary code on all the nodes that are present in the Ethereum network. What this allows us to do is, it allows Ethereum to solve for multiple use cases. Developers can write code and deploy that into an account, send some Ethereum to that account, and the code would then govern how and where the Ethereum in the account goes in the future. Such accounts are also known as smart contracts, and the whole use case of Bitcoin, a currency that has limited supply and is governed in a decentralized fashion, can actually be solved by a simple smart contract in the Ethereum network. Along with that, there are hundreds of other use cases that developers can write the logic for and deploy to the Ethereum network. This provides Ethereum with much more utility than Bitcoin, as it can now be used for more than one use case. What that means is you could write your own protocol on top of Ethereum, for example, a lending protocol, and the code will be available publicly. So people can read through that code and ensure there's no loopholes in it. And if they find that there isn't, they can use that, send transactions to that smart contract and execute, let's say, a loaning platform. And there are a bunch of other use cases that come up, for example, NFTs, launching your own blockchains, uh, launching a lottery-based uh, platform and so on. And all of these can be achieved on the Ethereum blockchain thanks to the concept of smart contracts. Let's try to go through a very basic contract that's written on the Ethereum blockchain. The idea is for us to just understand what smart contracts are, how they execute code, how they store data and things like that. So this is a basic smart contract. It's called storage. Uh, the idea is for people to be able to increment and set a certain counter on the blockchain and then retrieve its value as and when needed. So this doesn't really point to a very useful use case, but the idea is for you to understand how you can execute code on the Ethereum blockchain and how you can store data on it. So here, as you can see, there's a variable. The variable is called number. So once this contract is actually deployed on the Ethereum blockchain, this number variable that you see on line 11, this is actually part of the blockchain now. So there's no database that you need to store it. There's no centralized authority that's governing it. This is present in this wallet or in this contract on the Ethereum blockchain. And anyone can modify it by calling the store or the increment function. The store function actually sets or updates the value. And the increment function basically increments the value of the current counter and increases it by one. So now this is a contract that's deployed on the blockchain and anyone can call the increment method or the store method. Uh, to increase the value of this number. So this is governed by the people and this can be retrieved by anyone as well just to see what the current value is. So Ethereum basically lets developers deploy code on the network and also lets people store data on the network. The code is as you see here and the data uh, is what you see on line 11, which is a number variable. So this is how Ethereum tries to let anyone deploy any protocol that they want on top of the Ethereum blockchain. And hence the utility of the blockchain increases much more. The second problem that we discussed was proof of work was generally a little slow and wasteful. And Ethereum tries to solve that by using something called proof of stake, which we discussed in the last video. Ethereum has not yet moved to proof of stake and hence the transactions per second on it are still pretty low. But they claim that once they add proof of stake, ZK rollups, sharding, and a bunch of other optimizations to it, the transactions per second could go as high as 100,000 transactions per second. But that's still far away until the Ethereum V2 is released. So now let's try to dive into a new blockchain called Solana. Solana uses proof of stake as its consensus algorithm, but it has a few other optimizations to it, which makes it really, really fast. One of the biggest problem in distributed computing is maintaining a distributed clock. There are hundreds of nodes, each submitting transactions, and it becomes very hard and slow to synchronize these transactions across so many machines. 
The basic idea is that proving that an event happened at some point in time is hard and slow in a distributed world. If there are hundreds of nodes in a network, they'll take some time and a lot of internal communication to reach consensus around when an event happened. Solana solves this by introducing the concept of time to the blockchain by using something called as proof of history. The idea behind proof of history is that a validator on a node maintains a hash and keeps rehashing this hash as time goes by. Since every future hash needs access to the existing hash, this process can only be run on a single core. As validators receive a transaction, they add this transaction to the current hash before they go on to compute the next one. What this does is that when this validator submits a block to the other nodes for validating, it can prove the order of events and transactions by the proof of history ledger that it's maintaining. The other nodes on this network can validate this ledger on multiple cores by dividing the ledger into parts and validating each part on a different node. Hence, generating the proof of history sequence can only happen on a single core, thus consuming time and ensuring the validity of the event sequences, but it can be validated parallelly so that other nodes don't have to spend as much time to validate the sequence. Solana also lets you deploy smart contracts on the blockchain and hence tries to solve the first problem that we discussed as well. So anyone can deploy any use case that they want on top of the Solana blockchain. And thanks to proof of stake, proof of history, and a bunch of other moving parts that we're not discussing in this video, but you can find the link to them in the description. The Solana blockchain is really fast. And so if you're thinking of deploying more use cases that require high transactions per second, for example, building your own Facebook on top of the Solana blockchain, you can do that because the network is unnoticeably fast. And hence any smart contract that is deployed there, any transaction done on top of that smart contract will usually not take more than a few seconds. And from all the videos from here, we'll try to understand how you can deploy your own smart contracts and also interact with the smart contracts that already exist on the Solana blockchain. So I hope to see you in the next one where we start interacting with the programs that already exist on the Solana blockchain.